This episode of the Star Wars Battlefront Podcast is brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com slash battlefrontpodcast to help support this show. We're also brought to you by our PayPal supporters, paypal.me slash tie-dye sheep, T-Y-E-D-Y-E-S-H-E-E-P. Pick your class and learn your master points. Because it's time for the Star Wars Battlefront Podcast. Welcome to episode 140 of the Star Wars Battlefront Podcast. I'm your host, Sage Goodwin, joined by Gordy Hab, the composer for Star Wars Battlefront 2015 and Battlefront 2. Hey, how's it going? In this episode, we'll be going over his work in Star Wars Battlefront 2 and the process behind making a, a score for the game. Let's get started. If people don't know, like what what kind of what are the things that you've worked on before? Sure. So, actually, kind of got my start in video game scoring, at least uh, probably about nine or ten years ago. The first game I scored was this game called Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings. It was for um, the PS2, and uh, and I sort of landed that job because somebody at Lucasfilm had seen the Star Wars fan film that I had written the music for called Ryan versus Dorkman. <laughs> it was just a, a YouTube video of two guys, you know, fighting with lightsabers for five minutes. It was, uh, you know, really well received. And I guess some people at Lucas saw it and they were looking for a composer for an Indiana Jones game and gave me a call. And, and, uh, that sort of started, you know, the train, so to speak. And that led to Star Wars, the old Republic. And I worked on that game. And then after that, I worked on a game called Star Wars connect, uh, which is for the the Xbox Connect system when that first came out, um, and then I, I guess the the next thing was probably for at least in the Star Wars universe was uh, this Battlefront one. So there was a short break in the in the middle there when when the turnover happened uh, for, with the purchase of um, Lucasfilm by Disney. And, um, you know, sort of I sort of chased down <laughs> where, where all the games were landing, which happened to be EA and then, you know, started meeting some people at EA and continued my Star Wars journey, I guess, from there. Well, awesome. Uh, you also did the music for Halo Wars 2, right? Yeah, I did. I did. Another great score. So when you started working on Battlefront, you did scores for both both of the games. Um, yeah. what, what do you start with when you are starting to compose a score for a video game, let alone Star Wars video game? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, both of those games, Battlefront 1 and 2, for, at least for the score, were, were, um, were very different scores. So, uh, so I'll kind of talk about them in, in two parts. I mean, Battlefront 1, when I was asked to work on that game, uh, the direction was... Uh, much like the game itself, which was to be sort of, uh, you know, your, your opportunity to live in the in the world of the original trilogy films. Yeah. Um, the direction was we want the score to be a, a seamless, almost like the, the B side of the record from the original soundtrack so that it could fit in you know, perfectly with with that original score that John Williams wrote for those three films and uh, and feel like it was completely part of that score um but you know for for various video game reasons we needed to have new music uh written and recorded so, um primarily because the scores from john williams i mean he's dealing with a film with finite timelines and characters and uh, you know so the music would maybe play for 10 seconds before it would you know princess leia's theme would show up and then another 10 seconds and then it's you know, Darth Vader's theme or so on and so on. So we never had moments of music much longer than 10 or 15 seconds before it just jumped style completely. And for the game, we needed to have longer stretches of one particular style. Like, for example, like, a you know, a battle scene that didn't have you know, Princess Leia's theme popping up in the middle of it. You know, we needed just a two minute long piece of battle music um, that stayed within one mood and, and one thematic uh, approach. So that was sort of my goal was to come in and create these extended versions of uh, what was the original score. Um, but for Battlefront 2, uh, the gloves were off in many ways because the game opened itself up to all eras of Star Wars films, including, you know, uh, Rogue One and, and uh, you know, The Force Awakens and Last Jedi. 
and uh, even uh, the solo movie, which you know is in an expansion uh, that's either come out already or is coming out very soon. Uh, um, phase one's out. Phase two is yeah, coming right. out June. Right. Exactly. Later this so, month. yeah. So musically, you know, I mean, John Williams really expanded on that. Uh, you know, when they when we had Rogue One come out and, and Solo, those are different composers completely. So, you know, musically and stylistically, uh, you know, the the world is expanding. So, it really gave me the opportunity to sort of do my own take on all of it, rather than try to live, you know, so much in the world of what John Williams had created. So that was a lot of fun for me because, you know, there's new characters in the game. And with the single player, we had, you know, five or six new characters and, you know, one main character, Aiden Versio. Uh, you know, these all these characters needed brand new themes. So I, you know, was tasked with, with writing those themes and expanding them and, you know, building upon them and, and, you know, really kind of creating my own sound for it. So which is pretty much what I did for Backfoot too. How do you like to channel john williams like what what is that process do you go back and listen to like his music and i I would assume so but like going to take that and also like you're saying adjust it to where it's much longer in scope yeah like so like i was saying with 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 battlefront one there was definitely more of a you know i i know i need this music to to sit side by side with those scores that he had written and feel like they were part of the same world. So I, I spent a lot more time on the first game listening to what John had written for the original trilogy, studying it, uh, you know, learning sort of the orchestrational style that he used. Um, and it, and I, the, the analogy I've used pretty often to describe how I sort of approached writing music like that was to um, sort of, rather than imitate what he had written, because I was what I definitely wanted to do is write something that was original. I didn't want to just do a, you know, quote, knockoff of what John had done because yeah. why do that? Because they can use his music already. So, you know, they don't really need more of the same. They need it to be something unique that, you know, sort of, you know, defines battlefront. So rather than do sort of an imitation I did, uh, or like a paint by numbers, I, what I chose to do was listen to a lot of his music, sort of boil down what, it was that made his his artist color palette and then write my own music but use the same color palette so and that really came down to his orchestration style and so i i I learned a lot about you know how he orchestrates the music uh you know which instruments he chooses to play certain types of melodies that kind of thing and then i could just sort of forget about all of his music and just write my own thing but then you know, do it through the filter or through using the same palette that he used. Uh, and that was my approach for Battlefront 1. And I think it, it worked pretty well because, you know, I mean, I, you could listen to a piece of his music in a game and then seamlessly without even, you know, music stopping, it would just transition into something that I had written. And that would play for a few minutes and then it would seamlessly transition back into Williams. And that was sort of the formula for for Battlefront One, and I think it worked pretty well, almost to the point now where I listen when I listen to his scores from those original movies. You know, if I'm watching the movie and I'm listening along, my ear automatically assumes what's coming next is something that I had written. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I, now I've gotten used to the version that that I had done, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, but with Battlefront Two, I actually made a conscious choice to not listen to any of John Williams scores or Michael Giacchino's scores for uh, for Rogue One uh, during my writing process because I didn't want it to guide me too much. I mean, at that point, I sort of, you know, I already sort of understood the the John Williams, you know, Star Wars language well enough where I didn't feel I needed to reference it yeah. often. And, and I also wanted to, like I said, sort of branch out and do my own thing in a way. Uh, so, you know, it, naturally it ended up fitting into the Star Wars universe cause I'd already been doing this for a while. Uh, so I wasn't too concerned about whether or not I would be, you know, in the ballpark or not. I, I just figured, forget about all that stuff, write what I want. Most likely it'll come out, you know, feeling like it fits in that universe, which I believe it did. So oh, yeah. a good approach for me. I, I agree. Uh, it, it works perfectly for the setting. Um, also, you're, you're mentioning the, the the campaign. What was what was your main goal for the, that team, especially since it was the yeah. first first campaign that we got in the series since 2005, and 
new characters that were first starting off as the Empire. So what what, what was that process right. like? Now that that was the most fun and most challenging part of Battlefront Two, uh, scoring Battlefront Two. Um, it was fun because, in many ways, it was like scoring a film because it was narrative. Uh, we had characters that had you know true story arcs. You know, Iden, for example, you know starting out Imperial and and really having sort of a a journey and an arc into being you know uh, sort of. Uh, rebel sympathizer, so to speak. And, um, you know, so I wanted to write themes that, that had, um, I guess the word I'm looking at, I can't find the right word, but versatility, I guess is the best word, you know, a theme that could easily, um, you know, go from one style or mood or whatever you want to call it to another and still work no matter what. So that was a tricky process. And, uh, you know, that's something that I worked with the guys at Motive, you know, a lot on coming up with the Iden Versio theme, uh, because we wanted something, like I say, that could sort of translate between various moods easily. I mean, there's probably about 45 minutes worth of music that involves Iden Versio's theme in the game. So, you know, it also had to be something that I liked. <laughs> because I was going to be doing a lot of it. Um, so, for me, what was great and and you know challenging about the campaign was was really coming up with character themes. So you know, like I say, Aiden has a theme. Garrick also has a theme. Dell has a theme. You know, all these characters I approach it just like John Williams would have had, would have approached scoring a film, which is you know every every character has their own light motif, and then the score sort of writes itself from that point because I'm you know it's really all about you know what characters are involved in the scene, you know, and, and developing those themes and sometimes weaving those themes in and out of each other and, you know, much like he would do in the films. So that was a really cool challenge. It was, you know, much different than, for example, the multiplayer, which is, you know, definitely more, you know, in a given moment, what is what is happening? The music needs to accompany that. So if we're in a battle, you know, it's battle music and I need to make sure that we have enough of it to carry a, you know, an entire battle and it may be like 10 minutes worth of battle that you're playing. And so I need to make sure that I have a piece of music that can carry 10 minutes without getting boring, mm -hmm. you know? So it's much more of a utilitarian sort of uh, need for the music in the multiplayer, but in, in single player, it was definitely more of a narrative thing. So, you know, there's emotional moments, there's, you know, romantic moments, there's, you know, dark, sad moments and, you know, and I really, so, and, and all using the same theme. So I had to make sure that, you know, that theme could easily weave in and out of these different emotions. Yeah. What I would like to know is when you are going to go for that emotional theme, like what, what makes something emotional for music? Like what, what is that? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a, this is the million dollar question. And I think, every composer sort of approaches it differently. Um, you know, it's, for me, it's about, I don't know, it's, it's about singability a bit. Mm -hmm. I think the, tr the, the truest, most emotional musical moments throughout musical history, in a way, particularly symphonic music, are the, the melodies that you can sing. Things that, because I think to really re relate to the human emotion, it has to be something that is human and, and you know, humans sing and so that's the most you know sort of natural melodic thing that can happen that relates to a human emotion in my opinion uh you know doing some kind of very angular uh instrumental um melody can be really great but if if you can't actually sort of sing along or imagine yourself singing along um then there's that connection is missing so you know that's why i really was you know, I spent a lot of time making sure that the main themes for these characters in single player had melodies that were sort of within a very small musical range so that they could be singable. And I'm not saying that they were meant to be sung as, you know, the, the final product. I mean, they're being played by the orchestra. Yeah. In some cases, they are sung because we have a choir, too. But it needed to be something that you could potentially, once you learn that melody, hum along. And I think that that creates this connection, this human connection. Uh, you know, I mean, there's probably not too many people that couldn't sing the Imperial March if you were, were to ask them to. Yeah, exactly. Even though it's not a vocal 
melody, but it's within a very small range, uh, you know, musically so that it's easy for the boys to, to emulate. And I think that that helps make that connection. It's so funny that you mentioned the Imperial Mark, because as soon as you said that, that popped in my head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I mean, there, there's a reason it's so successful uh, as a melody. And, and in my opinion, it's because it is something that can be hummed. You know, if it was to have stretched, and I'm, maybe I'm getting a little musical geeky here, but I mean, if it had stretched, you know, an octave and a fifth worth of range, most most people particularly non-musical people can't really sing much out of the range of a, a fifth or a sixth. So mm -hmm. I, you, I always try to, if I'm trying to write a melody that's supposed to be, quote, human and emotional, I try to keep it within a range of, you know, at most an octave, because I think people can sing within that. Um, but if it stretches beyond that, it becomes to the point where, you know, people start to lose the connection because they can't imagine themselves singing it. Uh, so that was a sort of an important factor I tried to, you know, factor in. That that's that's great, and I I love that explanation of the how, like, because it is certain there are certain themes that I am not able to like. It doesn't pop to mind as easily as like right. Star Wars or like Harry Potter or right. even like going back to the 1950s TV shows, the Andrew Griffith Show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and that's actually another really interesting that you bring that theme up. You know, that's that's interesting because it's a whistling theme and that's not obviously something else that that people can do. <laughs> yeah. You know, most people can whistle, you know, just like most people can sing and whether or not it's good or bad is, <laughs> is, is irrelevant. Really, it's whether or not you can imagine yourself doing that thing. And uh, and that's what creates this sort of the thread that, that ties you into the melody and makes it, you know, sort of more human. You know, and I think that's why the Andy Griffith theme works so well. It's because, you know, whether they're doing it well or not, when it comes on, people whistle along or they yeah. sing along. And I think that really creates the connection. And that's what makes it work in many ways. Yeah, per it, I love the Andy Griffith show and like the, the theme yeah, is perfect. Um, yeah, totally. The guy, uh, was it uh, Bob Sweeney? Did the I think so. That did the the main theme. Mm -hmm. He he was yeah. genius. <laughs> like oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. It, it really is great. I mean, I grew up with that show. <laughs> so uh -huh. There's not an episode I haven't seen. So you know, it's, uh, and and it's it in many ways just like Star Wars did kind of define my childhood. Uh, you know, and so that theme is is stuck in my head forever. Yes, you know, for that reason. I can always go yeah. to the end of the show's theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so. Go, going to like your, your inspirations, like what inspired you to become a composer and like how did that journey of like what inspires your style? Yeah, sure. I mean, John Williams is a, a very large part of it. Uh, you know, the, the, the first time I can remember actually wanting to write music and or, or even just learn about music, I knew it was like an interest for me was after I saw E.T. in the theater, and I was probably only six years old. And, um, you know, I remember seeing it once and, you know, feeling all of the emotions that everyone felt when they saw that film. And, um, you know, then being sort of questioned by my parents who took me to see it, um, you know, they were trying to, like, sort of get to the bottom of why I was, you know, so sad when you <laughs> died. Like, well, what, why did you feel that way, you know? what did you think the main character was feeling? And, and, and I couldn't tell you the name of the main characters, <laughs> but I could sing all of the tunes. So it was sort of this, this aha moment, I guess, mo probably more so for my parents because I was so young. I didn't realize what was even really happening of, wow, he just saw this movie and, and can't name the characters in the film, but can sing all the, the melodies. And, you know, so the connection for me was to the music. And um, so we saw it again. And then I came home and I picked up my dad's guitar and I was trying to pluck out the, the main theme and this kind of thing. And they thought, oh, wow, this is that was sort of the defining moment, I guess, for me to start getting into music as a hobby. And, uh, you know, it really just kind of grew from there. And I've always been really since then, I've always been very fascinated with uh, with how music affects the human emotion. And particularly with film, because I think that's such a good medium uh, for music to to do just that and uh, actually affect human emotion. So uh, so pretty early on, I kind of knew I wanted to do this. Um, it's a long journey because, you know, very few people get to do it. Uh, even, exactly. 
you know, even if they're really great composers, it's a very hard business to get into. But, you know, I sort of set that goal very early in my life. And, you know, John Williams, I guess, you know, for having written the score to E.T. is, you know, it's his fault. (laughs) You know, Um, you did this to me. (laughs) Yeah, really. It's true. You know, and uh, and I think because of that, in a way, and I'm, I'm certainly not completely unique in this, you know, and John Williams being my number one influence on, you know, writing film music. Um, but because of when it happened in my life, I think that makes a big difference too. Uh, because it happened, his influence became strong in my life before I knew anything about music. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. You know, I know, I know a lot of people are very highly influenced by John Williams. I mean, he's probably the most successful film composer of all time. Uh, probably the most successful composer in his own lifetime ever. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, so sure, everyone's influenced by him in some way. But I was influenced by him before I understood what it even was that was influencing me. And so it became a part of sort of my DNA long before I even studied music or even learned what a major chord was or, you know, what a minor scale was or whatever. It's like I, the music was already in my in my soul before any of that happened. So when I started studying music, it was already there and that influence was already there. So to write this music and, you know, to sort of write it and make it feel like it's part of that, you know, that sound that John Williamson set up for Star Wars was actually, it wasn't a chore. It wasn't, it didn't require a lot of studying and and trying to figure out what it was he was doing. It was like, for me, it was more of a, now I can just do what comes naturally and it'll probably end up sounding like that if I just let go and do what comes most naturally um, versus a lot of other projects I'd worked on up to then. It's, you know, I'm always sort of fighting to figure out what the language, the harmonic language was going to be to, you know, create a certain mood. It's like with Star Wars, it was like, well, if I just write what comes most naturally, it's probably going to sound like it fits into the, you know, the Star Wars universe because that's so highly influential. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's also like pretty unique that instead of like, I was expecting you to go into Star Wars, but no, you went to E.T., which like yeah. overall isn't, <laughs> isn't like a huge, like super fantastical space opera kind of thing. It's very small and, but still captures that feel, um, yeah. which is, yeah. is a great score as well. Yeah, totally. I mean, to, to this day, it's, it's actually my favorite score that he's written. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's just simply because of the nostalgia involved or not, but you know, it, it really is a beautiful score. Um, but Star Wars as a as a film, that, that that to me was almost as influential as the music of ET was mm-hmm. you know, on me musically, because you know, as a kid of the '80s, you know, Star Wars was unavoidable. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, so uh, yeah, you know, I had all the toys. I, I, you know, saw the films, you know, I was too young to really to, uh, to see, you know, a new hope. I mean, I did see a new hope actually. I was a baby. My parents actually took me when I was one year old, which obviously, you know, I don't remember it, but I'm sure everyone in the audience remembers the baby that was probably crying. The whole time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but empire strikes back. I mean, that was like the first one I saw and really understood, <laughs> you know, and, and the one that actually had like a large influence on me. And, uh, so of course I, you know, I was, like I say, a kid in the 80s, man. There's no kid in the 80s that didn't want to, you know, be Luke Skywalker and, you know, want to play with all the toys. And, and I did all of those things just like everyone else. And uh, so Star Wars was my favorite thing growing up, you know. So and, and, you know, obviously the music itself was a huge influence on my love of those films as well. And uh, from for probably the same reasons that, the score for E.T. was so influential because John really knows how to uh, sort of tap into the human psyche with music and um, and really knows how to, you know, sort of create that invisible thread between the audience and the screen, you know, so you feel the emotions. And, and in many cases, you're not even hearing the music. It's just you just feel the emotions. It's not until after the fact that you leave the theater and you're like humming something and you're like, man, why am I humming that? You know, it's like, I don't yeah. remember even hearing it, but, but now it's in my brain, you know, sort of ingrained forever. You know, and that's, that's his greatness. Uh, what I love about the score of a new hope. And like, I've got all three of the original trilogy movie soundtracks on vinyl yeah. upstairs. 
Cool. That's um, awesome. <laughs> including the holiday special ones. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but what I love about the A New Hope is how when you watch the movie, the score isn't in your face punching you in your ears. It's very right. mild and comes in only when it needs to. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, even when it's there, it's not there. You yeah, know what I mean, like you don't you're, you're not your ears are drawn to it, even when it's there most of the time. It's only in the key moments where it really, you know, sticks out, I guess. You know, it, those, those are the moments where I remember this good analogy. Um, I'm not a big musical theater person, although I do like some of it. But Stephen Sondheim, in my opinion, is, you know, he, he's the best at doing musical theater. And I remember going to a master class that he was teaching. And um, he said this uh, really poignant thing I, that I took with me and I can apply to film music and game music as well, which is um, music comes in when words can no longer express the level of emotion. And so if in a, and it translates just as well in the film. So when a scene, when the dialogue, when the action you see on the screen can no longer show you the heightened amount of emotion that's necessary that's when music can stick out and really sort of take it to the next level. And I think A New Hope does that perfectly. It's like, you know, when you see um, the Death Star or, you know, like, in uh, you know, when you see the Death Star for the first time, visibly you see it and you're like, wow, this thing is huge. And, you know, you've already sort of gotten to know the characters a bit and, you know, how the level of emotion that's involved. And then, to take it to the next level, that's when you get these big brass chords that stick out and are loud and memorable. And so it really, that's the thing that takes you to the next level to really give you a full understanding of the, the weight that's involved in the, in the scene, you know? And so it really kind of translates well to film scoring, in my opinion, that, that Sondheim uh, tidbit. Oh, definitely. Like I haven't heard that, but that is beautifully put and like perfectly describes what, music should be yeah i agree completely now music can exist when there's when heightened emotion isn't necessary but in my opinion at that point music should be uh felt not heard and yeah. i think the best scores are felt not heard until they're required you know until they need to be called upon to take that emotion way over the top uh you know into that into that realm where words or actions you see can no longer express how emotional it really is that's when music can stick out and uh you know but yeah music you know sort of background incidental music can create an environment can create a mood an atmosphere whatever you want to call it and you know but it's best if you don't even notice it. you know you just feel something you know and he's well, he's great at doing that too so you know i mean i think a new hope is a really good example of that i mean tatooine when you're on tatooine there's a sound you know, and you're not really listening to it, but but you get this sort of bizarre, you know, alien, otherworldly feeling when you're there, you know. And it's otherwise, it's just a desert here on Earth, <laughs> you know. But something makes it feel like it's not here on Earth. Something makes it feel like it actually is this foreign alien planet. And in, in many ways, I think it's, it's obviously the things you see, you know, the creatures and this kind of thing and the droids and all of this. And, you know, but it's also... It's the music that's creating this bizarreness that I think, you know, sets up this alien world, you know, and you're not, it's, it's something that's not really meant to be heard. You just feel it. You know? Yeah. Just your description of that. I'm, I, I can, I can already feel tattooing the music and yeah. like what, every time I watch this, I'm like, I get, just get this warm, fuzzy feeling. <laughs> it's like, oh yes. Yeah. yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> Uh, going into kind of that a bit and going back to Battlefront, um, the ha what was it like to tackle all the different eras of Star Wars in your music? Because we've got the prequels, we've got the original trilogy, and we've got the new trilogy. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, so with the new trilogy stuff, that was actually extremely easy for me because my musical aesthetic, you know, naturally not, you know, if you were to ask me just to write for a different film, would probably sound pretty similar to what John had done on The Force Awakens. That's that's more in line with what I feel is my my most natural musical aesthetic. So 
getting into that world, I almost was able to just say, oh, I can forget about all this, you know, Star Wars music study and just do my own thing. And it'll probably sound a lot like that. And uh, so that was pretty easy. You know, the original trilogy stuff was surprisingly, in a way, the hardest for me to sort of get a grasp of because I, I knew really well because I grew up with it. And then, like I said, it was sort of part of my DNA already, but I'd never studied it and really tried to figure out what it was and made it work. And, um, and it's extremely complicated music. So um, when I really dug in, it was like a bit overwhelming <laughs> uh-huh. at first. And, you know, once I sort of, like I said before, sort of figured out what color palette he was using, then it became easy. When I was when I first started, it was like, I, I have to make this sound like it fits into A New Hope. That's that's going to be really tricky. So I need to I need to try to write a cue that sounds just like Tatooine. Now I need to write a cue like this. And I learned really quickly that that was not a good approach. So I sort of redesigned my approach and said, rather than make something sound like that piece of music, I'm just going to write whatever I want to write, but I'm going to use that same color palette that he used for that particular piece of music. It's almost like, you know, if, a, if an artist, if two completely different artists from two completely different eras painted a, a mountain scene, you know, like say Picasso did a mountain scene, it's going to look a lot different than Monet. But if they both used blue and yellow as their primary colors, you'll see the similarity, you know? So I was more thinking of it like that. It's like, okay, well, John Williams used blue and yellow to, to paint Tatooine. I'm going to write my own music, but I'm going to use blue and yellow, you know, and it's like that, that sort of helped me get into that world without being, you know, like doing direct imitations. And, uh, and, and that sort of became my formula for Battlefront one. Um, and it made it a lot easier for me. Uh, but with the prequel era stuff, you now that music, in my opinion, is maybe some of John's best writing ever. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's from, from every standpoint. I mean, melodically, the counterpoint, the harmony, I mean, the orchestration is absolutely brilliant, which, you know, can be definitely, you know, credited to John Williams, but also to, to Conrad Pope who orchestrated all that music. I mean, I think he's absolutely brilliant. And, um, you know, so I, for that stuff, you know, I did do some score study to figure out exactly how Conrad had orchestrated a lot of that music and, you know, tried to, uh, use those similar tools, you know, to orchestrate my own music. And, um, and that was a lot of fun to write because I think, you know, it's very crafty and, uh, and sort of, um, uh, cerebral in a lot of ways, that music. So that was kind of fun to sort of dissect, you know, and I, I had not heard anything from Rogue One before I actually had written the Rogue One expansion. So, you know, what I wrote for the Rogue One expansion was completely my own, original take and that was kind of fun too because there was no reference point for it you know i just did whatever i wanted <laughs> yeah you know and it's, it's, it came out very different than what you know michael giacchino wrote um but i think that's okay you know i mean it's you know i sort of got there first i guess you know six <laughs> months in in advance of him writing that score so you know it stuck and in the same way actually with solo because i you know i wrote the solo expansion music you know at the end of last year so everything that's in that expansion was written long before the solo movie came out so you know i never had an opportunity to hear any of that music before that so you know i did my own take on it so to speak so when you watch like have you have you seen solo yeah yeah when you watch that what what goes through your mind as the music comes or the music like soars in the background or dies down what what is your reaction to that music yeah you know i think I think Tom Powell did a, a really, really great job with that score. I think that he took it a different, a place that was pretty unique and unique to him. And I thought that was a cool approach. I mean, it's, it still feels a bit like Star Wars. It feels like obviously he was influenced by John Williams in some ways, but he's, he's doing his own thing too. I mean, he's adding electronics and yeah. you know, sort of a layering approach with, you know, big percussion and that kind of thing that, you know, is definitely a more modern scoring approach. You know, and uh, and I appreciated that because I think it's expanding the universe of Star Wars a bit. Um, but you know, all in all, that score really fit well to picture. And I felt like, you know, I I would say that I didn't really walk away with some major theme, you know, humming in my head like I would with the Williams score. But I never felt like anything was out of place. So um, yeah, I think he did a good job. It was more of that, like what we had talked about before, the 
you know, uh, felt not heard yeah. scenario for a lot of it. But the fact that I didn't notice it meant that it was done well in most cases. So I actually really enjoyed what he wrote. And what, what was your approach to the solo uh, music for the expansion? So I, I took this very, well, the first thing I wrote, now I'll say this, this probably helps sort of define how I was thinking of it. The first thing I was asked to write was, um, was music to accompany the Kessel Run. And, and I, I'm a geek. <laughs> you know what I mean? You say, oh my, you take, you allow me to write music for something that has been this sort of, um, you know, background. Yeah. I mean, this thing that I lived with as a child growing up, the idea of what the, what the Kessel Run actually was. I mean, you, you heard it. Why is it in the length of a distance? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like all these things are popping into my head and, and, and you know, my whole life I've been imagining what that, what that, uh, you know, was, what it was like, you know, how fast were they going? I mean, like how exciting was it? So I sort of took this, um, you know, very fast paced, uh, you know, pirate swashbuckling kind of approach, because that's how I think of Han Solo. I've always thought of him as sort of like this, you know, this, this rebel without a cause kind of, you know, he's a bit of a pirate, you know, he's the scoundrel that we all know, uh -huh. but then adding this level of uh, excitement and speed and, you know, um, you know, fast paced, you know, dodging things, you know, jumping around things. And so I kind of took that very exciting sort of, you know, swashbuckling approach. And interestingly enough, when I heard the main theme that John had written, um, when John Williams, because he actually wrote the main theme for Solo that John Powell used throughout the score. Uh, when I heard it, they're actually pretty similar, which is kind of cool in a way. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I was, I was pretty surprised when I first heard saw the film i was like oh my god this theme is you know just a couple notes different than the theme i wrote you know and it's like man have i really just tapped in the john williams psyche so much that i figured this out now or is it just the most obvious approach to score han solo and i'm not sure which it is but it's cool either way you that know, that is kind of, so kind of awesome fun. yeah totally well you have been called I've, I've been doing my research and you have been called the heir to john williams so <laughs> right yeah exactly i, I would I agree I with really that tapped into his brain at this point so yeah i'll take it I, I would love to see you do a whole movie on star wars like that'd be so awesome. yeah i would love that too trust me and it's a there's a mission in my life you know, and with with so many of them coming out, I don't see it as uh, as, as that far fetched. You know, I'm going to definitely try to get in front of the right people. You know, making sure people know that this is my wheelhouse, so to speak, and see what happens. I I, I definitely would love to see you score a Star Wars movie. Oh, that's awesome, man! It's <laughs> really cool. Um, so. And I love how like you you went with you went before you heard anything about Solo and wrote the Han Solo theme or the Kessel Run theme, and then John Williams does the same thing, and you come to the same conclusion? Like, that is so yeah. awesome. I know. I mean, I was blown away by that very thing. You know, I just thought, man, how, how, what are the chances of that? And then the more I thought about it, the chances are pretty high, considering. You know, I mean, it's uh -huh. like the character, that means a lot. That says a lot about about the character itself, you know, about the way... Uh, Han Solo was played in the original movies about the way he was written, about his dialogue, about everything about and about how, you know, John probably scored scenes that he was in, d defined him so well that two people, you know, having not heard either uh, of each other's approaches to, to writing a theme for him, were able to come up with something that's pretty remarkably similar. I think it says a lot for how well that character was defined in the original films. Oh, yeah, that that's awesome. <laughs> yeah definitely uh, especially like han solo i always thought was the cool cool uh character and yeah exactly he was so awesome like i could never be like han solo so i'm gonna be Luke. right exactly <laughs> exactly no i'm in the same way i was uh, too much of a nerd to be that cool exactly and uh you know so but you know so to write this theme was like you know i have to write something that's that is completely you know cool and fun and, and relaxed and but like also exciting and you know just kind of badass in a way and i mean that's that's who he is and you know so i basically was writing a theme for the person i wish i could be but no i can't uh -huh. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah so. 
because I, w- I was always Luke was my favorite character, but Han Solo yeah. I thought was so cool. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like, exactly. I He's nev- like the cool kid in school that you yeah know, you, you just want to be friends with. But <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I'd be the kid at home flying my little uh, toy Tie Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. I'm the same. Shooting, uh, yeah, making pew pew same. sounds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was me. That was kind of still me, to be honest. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> except That's now you funny. get paid for it <laughs> yeah exactly exactly uh-huh. so. it's like it's i great. i've been making a podcast on the go- st- uh, game star wars battlefront for be three years in november wow that's amazing that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> so I, i'm great i'm definitely luke <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah we're both luke I, I, i'm gonna yeah, i think we can agree on that yeah when you sure. get t-shirts <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I am Luke. Uh-huh. So. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's uh, awesome. W- one last thing before sure. uh, we get off, I want I want to I want to know like since games are so varied and they are so dynamic in their music, what what's your approach to making the music that's in the background that like constantly swells as the action does and then dies down? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's, there's well, there's two two factors in that i mean one's the you know the actual musical factor of you know trying to keep something interesting for long stretches of time that is basically within the same style tempo you know mood um and you know that's something that i've had to really perfect over time uh, because it's very easy to get bored with an idea and you know you hear it over and over and in a lot of games what happens is it's the same you know minute a music will loop over and over and then it's you know it gets tiresome and we needed to make it feel like star wars which never feels tiresome so um that was a tricky thing from a musical standpoint but from a technical standpoint it was even more tricky because to make it swell up when it's when it's uh extremely exciting and to duck back down when things are not really happening but still kind of feel like you're in the action um we had to create sort of a system for the music where um there are multiple versions of the same piece of music written and recorded and give with within a given scenario, the audio system will, will mute one version of that and crossfade into another version of it. So you're hearing maybe like, you know, the bass level is just, you know, um, kind of sort of a mid level, not heavily orchestrated, but still rhythmic and, you know, action music. And that'll be playing for a bit. And then, you know, more, TIE fighters show up or something like that that'll trigger the audio engine to pull up one of many transitions I'd written that would help transition to the next layer which is a completely different piece of music that's written on the same uh, framework as the first piece of music and you know they follow along in the exact same timeline and uh, at any given point you can transition to one from one to the other and in most cases we'd have about four different versions of the same action music playing uh just you only hear one at a time but but there are four simultaneously playing sort of in the same timeline and you can switch between them and that was a kind of a tricky thing with this type of music because this music's never in the same key tempo meter whatever you want to call it for more than five or ten seconds in order to make it exciting so it wasn't like i could just be like well we're in d minor so the layer two as long as it's in d minor we're cool you know, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, no, I need to make sure that harmonic is following the exact same harmonic structure as the first piece of music I wrote, uh, following the same tempo and meters. And, uh, you know, so that at any point when you jump from one to the next, it still feels like it's a continuation of the same piece of music. It's just now bigger or more exciting or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and from a from a technical standpoint, it was like sort of like reverse engineering, a, you know, the biggest crossword puzzle ever. <laughs> and uh-huh. it was a. Uh, you know, sort of um, a mind game in a way, you know, but but kind of fun. You know, it was a, it was a cool puzzle yeah, to solve, I think. That's amazing. You, you've ruined me. Now I will always be <laughs> playing, when I'm playing the game, I will be hearing that. Yeah, exactly, man. It's, uh, now that you know, it's, it's hard to not hear it, you know, but it was a really cool approach. And it's not, it's not an unco- uncommon approach to have a layering system in a video game to create, um, you know, the addition of more tension or more action or whatever. But typically what is happening is it's actually layering in parts of the music. 
So, you know, if it's, it'd be one piece of music where, you know, all you're hearing right now is the bass and drums. And then the next layer can be added in and the next layer is like the string section or whatever. And then the next layer is like the, the brass and the woodwinds or whatever, um, which works just fine in most musical scenarios. But it doesn't work for Star Wars because in order for it to feel like Star Wars, you really need the entire orchestra involved at every given moment. I mean, that's what makes that sound, that symphonic sound. So it had to be the full orchestra playing at all times, the next layer had to be the full orchestra playing something different. You know, it had to be like a, a more heightened version of what they played before. So that was the tricky part. It's, it, it almost required me basically to write four times as much music for any given moment to make sure that the audio system would work, you know, which is kind of, like I said, it was, it was like a puzzle. <laughs> yeah. But, a, you know, a really fun puzzle to solve. So, uh, What... How how much involvement are you do you have with like that process of putting your music in the game? Is it like you get it done and then you get out, or is it more like you're working in with like the engineers to make that thing a reality? Yeah, I mean, it, most of my involvement with with that part of it is is in the beginning stage before I actually start the writing. It's sort of coming up with that concept, you know, okay. and making sure that everyone sort of agrees on it because you know. In the case of the multiplayer, for example, Dice, you know, has a team of audio people that were implementing the music that I was writing. Yeah. But every note of music that was written was, you know, written and, you know, built into like a mock-up proof of concept well before we recorded it, you know, and, and in cases tested and some things failed and didn't really work and we had to reapproach it. And, uh, this, this thing kind of didn't work. Let's try it this way now, you know, and so I'd rewrite something and then I'd send over a mock-up and they'd put that in the game it's like okay now it works yeah that's great so then i would orchestrate it and we'd record it so i was involved in the in the conceptual stage of it but not so much in the implementation i mean they have a whole team of people putting the final versions into the game so so, so what's what's the timeline so was this like already this is while they've got all of the main stuff uh for the game completed like all of the like the main gameplay mechanics and the 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 character models and that kind of thing right um right. so th that's like at what stage the music come in yeah in the process uh, it you know it, it kind of varies like so for battlefront one as an example uh i was i was involved at a earlier stage of production and um and probably more so because the team hadn't worked with me before and they wanted to make sure that you know, there was enough time built into the schedule to get it right, yeah. you know. And um, so I worked on Battlefront 1 for probably a good part of a year on and off. Mm -hmm. And uh, But, you know, everyone was comfortable with me at that point. And so Battlefront 2, um, from, from the moment I started really writing music to the moment we started recording all the music was probably about three months, four months, something along those lines. So it was a much more truncated schedule. Um, and where that is in the process of production is I'm usually starting to write music when there's not much to look at other than concept art. Okay. So, you know, so I'm looking at still images of a planet or a still image of a character, you know, maybe like in the case of the uh, single player campaign, I was reading scripts that had images of the characters. So I was not looking at actual picture or like cinematics cutscenes or anything like that i was actually just looking at scripts and images and as i'm writing those things are being developed so uh that's why i was very much more like writing from a conceptual theme standpoint you know rather than writing full you know fully orchestrated pieces of music i'd write a theme that i could play on the piano you know and say here's the theme i'm thinking for Iden, and then just play it you know and it's like, oh, yeah, that's good. Maybe we can tweak this note, this note, you know, until we got it perfect. And then by the point that we were all in agreement on what the themes were, by that point, I started to get, you know, sort of, you know, some rough drafts of cutscenes so I could actually score it to picture. Mm -hmm. um, and that was actually, you know, I didn't mention this before, but what was great about working the single player was the fact that there were so many cutscenes and I actually got to write music to picture much like a film so you know rather than just writing pieces of music i know it'd be like you know just put in there later you know underneath yeah uh, you know all the action i was actually like 
you know, hitting the cuts in the picture and, you know, this character shows up and I can bring that theme in there. And, you know, then it transitions out into like a, you know, sort of a spacey atmospheric cue and we cut outside of the ship or, you know, it's like much more like actually scoring a movie Mm -hmm. than a game, which was kind of fun. Yeah. You can be more, much, much more deliberate with like the music. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, I, I said 45 minutes and we've gone over what I, I love though. Um, I could, I, awesome. I could literally talk to you about music for <laughs> hours because, <laughs> like, I, Likewise. I love like music. Uh, I'm working on a like a sci-fi audio drama series. Oh, cool! That I'm learning to compose for. Like, that's great. Very early on, it's going to be very like synthy. So, that's I, cool. I love talking about music, especially with people that know way more than me. Because, <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I am like level two, and you're probably like level one hundred. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's so, fun though, man. Uh, thank you, thank you for spending the time with me and uh, stay on the podcast. Great. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I had a blast. Uh, what is your cool. Twitter? Is it like at Gordy Hab? Hab? It's at Gordy Hab. Yeah. Okay. And um, my website. H A A B. And my website is gordyhab.com. Go 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 follow him. Go to his website. It's awesome. Um, cool. I had a I had a huge fun time uh, just talking with you. Likewise. Likewise. Thanks so much. Yeah. See ya. Cool. I'll see ya.